Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. Well, if you want to talk to somebody about a superstar, then... Ideally, somebody that's written the book about them. So, joining me now, who's written the authorised biography of Trevor Ford, is Neil Palmer. How are you, mate? I'm fine, thank you very much. And thanks for um, thanks for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I it's, really do. It's absolutely uh, mine and Terry Curran's pleasure to uh, to have you here. First of all, I want a little bit of a backstory because um, we've never spoken before, we haven't linked up before. And then also, then after that, why Trevor Ford? Now, I was talking to my dad yesterday, and he said, Nip, Trevor Ford, what a centre forward at the Villa. But he was born in Swansea. He first, his first club was Swansea Town before they went into Swansea City. So, a little bit about you, and uh, how did you come about, Trevor? Well, um, massive football fan, I'm a... A child of the uh, of the sixties, um, so the sixties and really the seventies were were my era. My dad um, was an apprentice, was a uh, apprentice at Cardiff City. Uh, Trevor Ford is a player who <laughs> he's, he, every single centre forward that ever that's ever been on the television is always measured by Trevor Ford, as far as my dad's concerned. He does the same with singers; he compares them all to Frank Sinatra. So Trevor Ford was a was always the name, what a centre-forward he was, what a centre-forward he was. And the book really came about, I'd done a few sort of bits and pieces, uh, I did some stuff for Cardiff, and I did some books of Bristol City, who was on my my club. And we had, I went to a Cardiff game with my dad, and it was a you know, cold Tuesday night, and I think Cardiff were playing somebody like Hull City. Um, what Cardiff year was that? Nice. That would probably have been about 94, 95. Got you. So we're sat there and my dad's gone, God, there's Trevor Ford sat down there. And Trevor was sat there, camel hair coat, looked absolutely immaculate, just sat on his own. And I was aware of people coming up to him and asking for his, his autograph and that sort of stuff. And I just remember watching the game, but also one eye on Trevor Ford. And then I just did a lot of research on him then and said, right, well, no one's ever, I couldn't believe anyone had, hadn't written a book about Trevor. And then, so I thought, well, maybe I should do it because if some of the stories that my dad's told me about Trevor are true, then, you know, that, 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 that will make for a, a book. And also I always felt he was a little bit forgotten yeah. um, regarding when they talk about great Welsh footballers and, and, you know, fair enough, you've got your John Charles and rightly so, even like your Gareth Bales and your Ian Rushes and stuff like that, and Ivor Oldchurch. But Trevor always seemed to be forgotten in a way. And um, and then I contacted, I managed to get hold of his son, David, who's, who's still a friend to this day. And uh, yeah, between the two of us, he told me stuff. And I you know, went here, there and everywhere. And that's really how the book came about. Now, Trevor, do you think he was forgotten because... He got banned, didn't he? Yeah, I, he was. I mean, sort of moving on with his career. What he did is he he wrote a book when he when he was at Cardiff, which would have been about fifty six, I think, called yeah. "I Lead the Attack." Yeah. Now, what he did with that book is he, he he what he wanted to do was force this business of a maximum wage. Trevor was he wasn't like footballers of that generation. Um, when you talk to players who shared. Uh, changing rooms with him he was like a bit of a film star to be honest but in the phrase is he knew his own worth and by that he knew and he would say it people have come to see me they haven't come to see a fullback and they haven't come to see a goalkeeper correct they've come to see me because i put the ball in the net and you know all right there was a certain amount of arrogance like that but you understood where where he was coming from yeah and so he knew his own worth and he wanted to force the issue now he'd been at sunderland 
the Millionaire Club, and he, he'd had payments and that sort of thing. So we thought if he forced the issue. Point being then, when the book came out, he was banned, and it was a perfect excuse at the time, which, as I say, would have been about 56. His Welsh career was stopped straight away by the Welsh selectors because what they did, it was their opportunity to get to get Trevor because he was very outspoken, outspoken about the way things, the Welsh FA ran things with committees. And in the end, I know it's moving forward, but he wasn't selected for the 58 World Cup, um, which he, he was devastated by the fact that he wasn't, even though he was really almost out of football, but he was over in Holland at the time, still scoring goals. But they didn't want anything to do with him. And as it turned out in 58, there was no cover for John Charles. Charles gets injured and the quarterfinals, they play Brazil and they haven't really got a centre forward. And it would have been, it's all in hindsight, I know, but it would have been the perfect stage for Trevor Ford. But he wasn't. And when you look at some of the players who went in his place, they certainly weren't of the calibre of Ford. But he was outspoken. Now, that's exactly why he got banned. Exactly why they wanted to shut him up, because he yeah. was outspoken. And nothing ever yeah. changes in football. They like this kind of old boys kind of club, but it isn't yeah. quite like that. Sunderland, no, you, ref- mean... you reference Sunderland, the, 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 the millionaires. They were known as the Bank of England club as well, wasn't they? They were indeed. And what happened with them, what, one of the great stories that, that I was t- Stan Anderson told me, and it was great to speak to the late, great Stan Anderson who played for Sunderland, Billy Bingham at the time, who, who shared jet change rooms with him. Trevor was invited by a director. He just signed for Sunderland, and he was invited by a director to go and play snooker with him. And he said, I'm, I'm not really a snooker player. And the director said, no, come on, you will have another game. And then he said, we'll play for £100, Trevor. Now, bearing in mind a footballer was on £20 a week, and Trevor sort of went, well, you're, you're joking, aren't you? And he went, no, we'll have a game. And as it was, that was the way that Sunderland paid Trevor the £100 a month that they were paying him. They were paying him because they would play snooker every single month, and the, the director would always leave. <laughs> And that's how that's how they they paid Trevor. <laughs> but um, it was yeah, and it was interesting because he was in a side, and, and there was always conflict between him and Len Shackleton. Yes, I read that. Yeah, and Shackleton was. I, I could only describe it when I was doing when I was doing the book, and a lot of people said to me, "If you imagine that Southampton side of years ago, the best way to understand it is that the Southampton side of years ago had Alan Shearer in it and Matt Latissier." Now, Shackleton was very much a Letitia. Fantastic footballer, could turn it on, but sometimes only turned it on when he wanted to. Whereas Trevor was like Shearer, blood and guts, put his head in there anywhere. Mm. And that's what, they were two completely different players and they didn't exactly gel together, if, if, if you know what I mean, because they were, they were worlds apart. Yeah, they clashed, didn't they? I yeah, mean, they did clash. I suppose if you're looking at the... Um... You know, football, and you could put two players together. I mean, ideally, you put Trevor Ford and you put Len Shackleton. What one didn't yeah. have, the other had, and, and, and vice versa. And two of the biggest and greatest names uh, in, yeah. in professional football. And uh, Shaq was no shrinking violet, neither, wasn't he? When he wrote his no. autobiography, he left a chapter, pay, a chapter blank, didn't he, about the directors of football? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly, where he just sort of left the page, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And well, said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything they know about about football and that was it and i didn't and i didn't in doing the book and writing that bit about sunderland i didn't want to do a disservice to shackleton because shackleton was a fantastic footballer oh, yeah. but they were just completely different yeah. and he, shackleton was very much own grown northeast guy looked at trevor trevor was always immaculate fabulous suits had, a, had an american cadillac um and had all the trappings of as you can imagine, a modern-day footballer. He was literally yep. like a modern-day footballer in the 1950s. And I think Shackleton never really enjoyed that sort of that sort of side of Trevor. Now, you mentioned and referenced the great John Charles. Ron Atkinson once says to me, um, if you had a machine and it was possible to put all the ingredients in to make the perfect footballer, it come out as John Charles. And John Charles mm. describes Trevor Ford as his idol. I mean, that is some accolade. It is incredible, isn't it? It really, really is. Um, 
And as we all know, you know, like they say, Charles could play centre forward, he could play centre half. Yeah. And I think he respected Forder the way he was from a point of view of maybe playing centre half as well. He knew what he could do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a tremendous accolade. Now, he started his career at Swansea Town, which is now Swansea City, but they were Swansea Town uh, back in the day. Uh, 16 league uh, appearances, 9 goals. So, start of his career, pretty decent. He moves to Aston Villa, 47-50. to 120 league games, scores 60 goals. Every other game he's scoring. Yeah. Moves up yeah. to Sunderland, and although he's not getting on particularly well with Shaq, his striking partner... He does yeah. even better. He's like 108 league goals. He scores 67. So like, right away, yeah. yeah, even when there's not that chemistry between them off the pitch and even on the pitch, he's still yeah. his figures are up there. I mean, he's got to go down as one of the greatest goal scorers of all time, largely in the first division. Three years he was at Cardiff, 96 and 42. He scored yeah. almost a goal every other game when he played at PSV, and he was in. His, yeah. He was about 33, 34. Come back, played for Notts County. Uh, sorry, Newport County. Yeah. He, he scored three goals in eight. So, and and then he went on loan to Romford, and he's still scoring a goal, a goal every other game. Yeah, so yeah. Consistently, a goal every other game from from 1942 to 1961. That's incredible. Yeah, he was consistent. It, it is an incredible goal scoring record, and like I said, I do feel sometimes, you know, he he, he never really gets the the, cre- the credit that he that he does deserve. I mean, when I did the research for the over for PSV, they absolutely loved him. He was the very first foreign footballer to go over there. Now, it may well not have been of choice because that's all the options he had because he was sort of uh, suspended from the British game. But went straight over there, and they absolutely loved him. And even to this day, he's he's revered over at PSV. Um, and what was he there? Probably two, three seasons, something like that. Yes, yeah, but yes, yeah, scored. Yeah. And and this was the point. He was scoring in 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 the Dutch league at the time. And this was about the time when Wales were looking for a, uh, were picking their squad for the fifty eight World Cup in Sweden. And he never even got a look in because. You know, A, they'd had a guts full of him, and B, they thought, well, he's, if he's playing abroad, there's no, you know, there's no need for us to pick him. Yeah. You know, when you look back on it, it's so short sighted that nobody even went over to Holland to go and watch him in. I mean, again, like I say with the research, some supporters felt that he'd retired after Cardiff. Yeah. Um, and yet he, they didn't realise, not many people realised he'd, he'd gone and played in Holland. Because again, it was very different times. I mean, now if the equivalent player goes and, you know, plays abroad, you've got Sky Sports News and it's on the telly all the time. But back in yeah. them days, there was there was none of that. The, the newspapers, as soon as you went abroad and you played abroad, you were kind of forgotten. So, you yeah. know, it, it's understandable that the fans thought that Trevor had indeed uh, retired where where he hadn't and and as you say still revered to this day uh, at PSV in Eindhoven and not just the first foreign player to play for PSV got to be one of the first English players to play in Holland how long did the research take you I know the book came out a few years ago it was published by yeah. Amberley Publishing yeah yeah, it came out in 2016. It took me probably 18 months. Yeah. But what was such a great help was his son David. Yeah. Because his son David was, you know, it was it really really helpful. But it was it was a it was a long process of breaking it all down and you know club by club and that sort of stuff really. So um, and I think one of the best things about it was then when I went to there was a I first went to the Welsh FA to see if they had anything. And in the foyer of the Welsh FA in Cardiff, they had banners up of ex-players. Well, Trevor wasn't wasn't on there. Incredible. And when I'd finished the book, and after a couple of months, I went to another uh, event at the Welsh FA, and there he was. It was a big... And that was, you know, that was a fantastic moment for me to think Mm -hmm. that maybe they'd recognised what he'd done and, and, and what he'd done for football, really. It is quite incredible that you're forgotten even by your own 
And it can only be mm. for the fact that in football sometimes you get that reputation, you get banned, you get blacklisted. Mm. And it's almost as though the whole of the game toes the party line and all sticks yeah. together and there's no mention of them, which is quite incredible. It's brilliant that yeah. you write books and other people write books about these players and then it changes because those players should never be forgotten. No, absolutely. Well said. No, that's true. Very true. And, he, and, he, and as I say, he was outspoken. Um, these uh, guys who were apprentices at, at Cardiff used to tell me that when Trevor used to come in, and if he was sort of going to have a going to have an argument with Trevor Morris, the Cardiff manager, they'd all be listening because Trevor spoke his mind and Trevor, you know, did this and did that. And it was like that through through a lot of his clubs. He uh, he he really, you know, he, he, he said he said what he thought and he didn't he didn't uh, he, he didn't really care to be honest. And a lot of the people I've spoken to who played against him, particularly goalkeepers, you know, he would. He, it was the days when you could hit someone into yeah. the net and that was it and Trevor would do that and then you know there was a lovely story with Con Sullivan who played for Arsenal at the time and Con said he used to come up and I always had one eye on Trevor in the box and I knew that he was coming when the ball came over I knew that at some point Trevor was, was coming out through the melee of crowds uh, of players and then he'd hit me and I'd go in and then he'd, he said afterwards, and I'd get the ball and he'd just give me a little tap on the back and go, sorry about that, mate. And then just carry on and carry on. Do you know what I mean? So it, 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 was a, it certainly was a different, different game then. Yeah, it was never personal. It just was part of that game. And that's what a, a central striker's job was to do. Put yeah. the ball in the back of the net. Now, if the goalkeeper had got yeah. both hands on it, he's going in there too. Well, he, I mean, like I said, he did. He, he, he was, when, you, when you, you, you listen and there's the odd interview and, and, and players he spoke to who were teammates of his, and he used to say things like, full house today, look what we're getting. And how much are they charging? Yep. And... There's 58,000 here at Roker Park. Yep. And we're getting 20 a week. Do you know what I mean? And things that that other players never really thought about, or if they did, they just kept their mouth shut because obviously the the, the clubs at the time held all the cards. Yep. And, but he wouldn't, he'd go toe-to-toe with them, you know, and say, you know, that's that's why you why I'm here. And he loved it at Villa. And I, and. And there was an interesting story about him when, when he was 15 and he was, you know, you imagine he was 15 years of age and he's in Swansea. And this tells you about the sort of belief that he had, had in his own ability. Arsenal came knocking on the door for him to sign for Arsenal when he was 15 and he turned them down yeah. in front of his mum and dad and said, I don't think I'm ready yet. Let me make me name at Swansea. And Arsenal scout went away and that, and that was it. Mm. But for a 15-year-old who wants to be a footballer and then Arsenal knock on the door and he just sort of went, no, I'm, I'm not ready at the moment. That shows you incredible belief in the sort of person that he was. Oh, doesn't it just? But then another terrific football club coming for him, Aston Villa. How did that move come to it. Midlands? Yeah. How, he, how did he, it come he, about? Well, it, th- th- there were numerous clubs that were after him. Yeah. And, uh, and there was... It was very difficult with them trying to get round this business of what they were offering, because, you know, I mean, so he's he's on I don't know twenty quid if that at, at Swansea. Yeah. Well, essentially, you would say that when you go for transfer negotiations, a what's the point? Yep. Because Villa's going to offer you twenty quid. Yeah. But it was the way when the directors came that they would offer you this and offer you this. But what appealed to him was. It was such a massive football club. Yeah. You know, the tragedy is when you look at his career, he only won the Welsh Cup when he was at Cardiff. Yeah. You know, he went to Villa because he would want, as everybody did then, wanted to win the FA Cup. Same with Sunderland. Um, And it's a tragedy that he never won anything like that or a championship. But essentially, as I say, the Villa thing was just, Villa were just the biggest club that came in for him. and, And that was it. I think he... I think they paid something like nine and a half thousand pounds for him. And then when he went then to Sunderland and they broke the British transfer record of 30,000, there was an arrogance about Trevor that it weighed heavy on him, but there was something about him that he, he loved it. You know, he loved the fact that he was the most expensive footballer at, at the time. 
an absolute legend and a god of association football. And finally, any story, because we want people to go and buy the book, I shall go and buy the book. Any story that you look at and think that was just so funny, I really enjoyed writing that little paragraph or that little story about Trevor. And how can people still purchase the book? How's the best way to get hold of Trevor's book written? Well, you can still get you can still get the book on Amazon yeah. and you can get it through Amberley Publishing on their on their website as well. Um the whole thing really with, with Trevor, what I enjoyed more than anything was just sort of immersing yourself in a football of a different time and a different generation. And it was different from the way the clubs were run to the way that footballers were. And the footballers were grateful almost as that they'd been given the opportunity. But what really stood out, as I say, I've said it before, you got a sense and a feeling about Trevor, the fact that this was a man who was like a modern day footballer and knew his own worth. And I think that runs right the way through the book, to be perfectly honest. Superb. Thank you so much uh, for your time, Neil. Too oh, it's good, been a pleasure. Too pleasure. good to be forgotten. The great Trevor Ford. And you are uh, writing another book now about Jeff Merrick that's going to be available uh, in 2022. And what else have you got on the back burner? What's your next project? Well, I've got, I mean, there's a few things, you know, you you always have, have the odd uh, ideas here, there and everywhere. Um, at the moment, I'm just sort of looking through stuff. I've had a bit of a break because the, I did the Jerry Gow book and now the Jeff Merritt. They sort of almost came back to back, but that was the joy of lockdown for me. Um, but yeah, um, at the moment, when I'm just looking through a, a, a couple of ideas, really. And there's not going to be a book about the um, chimpanzees tea party at Ashton Gate <laughs> in 1976 <laughs> yeah, against West never, Ham United. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, do you? You never know. There was some... Uh, there was some very strange half-time entertainment going on at Ashton Gate back in the 1970s. I can tell you. <laughs> Too much <laughs> cider, I think, my mate. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. Neil, can I thank you so much, sir? And on our no, next, on our next uh, part four of Book Corner uh, with um, with Andy from MyFootballBooks.com, will you be my author of the month and we'll uh, reconvene and we'll talk about other books that you've got, what you've done, etc., and what you've got uh, future uh, titles uh, in a little bit more depth. So thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers, Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Planning for your next trip? Elevate your travel style with Quince. Quince has all the jet setting essentials you'll want for your next getaway, like European linen, premium luggage options, buttery soft Italian leather bags, and so much more. And is all priced at 50 to 80% less than similar brands. Plus, Quince only works with factories that use safe and ethical manufacturing practices. Pack your bags with high-quality essentials you'll be wearing for vacations to come with Quince. Go to quince.com slash pack for free shipping and 365-day returns.